So we left off on Friday with the coagulation problem. And we had stated that alum, sorry, alum reacts with bicarbonate, forms aluminum hydroxide and six CO2s. Okay. So the question is, how much alkalinity would be consumed? Now, alkalinity is it's approximately equal to the bicarbonate concentration. Exact alkalinity is equal to the bicarbonate concentration plus two times the carbonate concentration plus the OH minus concentration minus. So this is in most fresh waters and most of the systems that you, you will deal with in environmental engineering. <clears throat> At most of the fresh waters we deal with are between a pH of six to eight. And in those situations, the concentrations of <clears throat> OH minus and H plus are negligible. And the concentration of carbonate is small compared to the concentration of bicarbonate. As you raise the pH, above eight or so, you're gonna find that the carbonate concentration increases greatly and you can't ignore carbonate in the alkalinity equation. But for the most part, we can assume that this is true. So when we're looking at this equation, we can then look at the stoichiometry, okay, and I just realized I missed a six there. So for every one mole of alum that we add, we're gonna consume six moles of bicarbonate or six moles. So we previously calculated that we were adding 2.1 times 10 to the minus two millimoles of alum. And if we multiply that by six millimoles of bicarbonate for every one millimole of alum, so that's just the stoichiometric ratio. And that is, now alkalinity, it's usually reported not in millimoles, but it's reported in equivalents or in milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. So we need to convert this to milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate in order to, to obtain the traditional units that are used in environmental engineering. So we have 1.26 times 10 to the minus one and 0.126 millimoles per liter of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, we can typically use the charge There are one milli equivalents per one millimole for bicarbonate. That's true for bicarbonate. For carbonate, it's actually two, and that's this two here, is actually two milli equivalents per millimole are actually equivalents per mole. So we can write this down as 1.26 times 10 to the minus one milli equivalents per liter of bicarbonate. And then the last set of calculations, we have 1.26 times 10 to the minus one milli equivalents per liter, it's our bicarbonate concentration there are 50 milligrams per milli equivalent of calcium carbonate. There is a video that I produced actually for 480 on hardness and alkalinity. It's on YouTube, it's on the YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, that actually goes through all of these calculations in much more detail. So if you haven't done these types of calculations in a while, you don't remember this from uh, 280, that video's there, you might wanna take a look at it. Um, there's also another video that I can provide from a colleague that also 
essentially has done the same types of calculations. So what this says, and is we would consume by the addition of the alum at 12.5 milligrams per liter of alum is going to consume 6.3 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. So that is the amount of alkalinity. So this is our delta alkalinity, the amount of alkalinity that's consumed. I added a page in there and I didn't need it. Okay, so what I wanna do now is we're gonna move on to rapid mix. So we're, we've looked then at how do we <clears throat> determine alum doses. We've looked at the reaction of alums. Now we really want to look into the design aspects. Question was how do we get the 50 milligrams per liter? So calcium carbonate has a molecular weight of 100 milligrams per millimole. Calcium is 2 plus Carbonate is two minus. So the number of equivalents per mole is two. We can just use the charge. It's more complicated than that, but for the most part, for most systems, you can simply use the charge on the ion that you're looking at. <clears throat> so N is equal to two, that's two milli equivalents per mole, per millimole. So for every millimole of calcium, it is two milli equivalents. So equivalents of charge is really what you're, we're thinking of. So if we take this 100 milligrams per millimole, we have two milli equivalents per millimole. Millimoles cancel or we did this in moles, it wouldn't matter. So that gives us 50 milligrams per milli equivalent. This is the equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. So when we're converting from milligrams, we can convert from milligrams per liter as the ion to milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate, we'll use the equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. And that's critical because <clears throat> when we look at, for instance, when we look at hardness, everything, all of our measurements, all of our recording is always as milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. Those of you in 480, that have been measuring alkalinity and hardness have probably noticed that the calibration data that you're given, your concentrations are in milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. And that's what you'll report. And this is what we traditionally use. We use this for alkalinity, we use it for hardness. So we will use it in a number of cases and we use it in terms of, it's good, review, alkalinity is the buffering capacity of a water. So it's the ability of a water to resist a change in pH upon the addition of an acid. And when we talk about acidity, here we're looking at addition of an acid. With alkalinity, we're looking at that change in pH, the ability to resist a change in pH upon the addition of a base. So that's the difference between alkalinity and acidity. Any questions before we move on to design aspects? Some important questions and I wanna make sure that you understand these concepts. So looking at rapid mixing, Rapid mixing is used to blend chemicals. That's, that is the purpose of rapid mix. As you, as you might recall, I said that rapid mix, we're looking at 
making sure that the chemicals we're adding, so we make coagulants, or we actually use it with softening when we're adding the softening reagents, we want to make sure that they're well mixed, well dispersed within the water that we're treating. So there's a number of types. This is a turbine chamber. We have a propeller type. Um, this is a double. Um, we have a paddle chamber and we have an inline blender. So we've got multiple types of systems. The only difference is really the shape of the system. In this case, it's actually the mixer is actually within the piping, the piping system, but they all operate the same way. They all have the same goal of dispersing and blending the chemicals with water. Hey, Dr. Master. Yes. Um, I have a question about the alkalinity and acidity. Sorry to cut you off. Sure, no problem. We can go back. Okay, so what I got is that alkalinity is the buffering capacity of water. And is it alkalinity or acidity that resist change of pH upon adding an acid or a base? Okay, so alkalinity is the ability of a water to resist a change in pH upon the addition of an acid. Acidity is the ability of a water to resist a change in pH upon the addition of a base. Okay, perfect, thank you. So it's just kind of one you're looking at a decrease in pH, the other one you're looking at an increase in pH. Um, in chemistry, they just use the term buffering capacity. In, engineer, in environmental engineering, we use alkalinity and acidity. <clears throat> These reactions are rapid. Typically, they take less than 0.1 seconds. Uh, for alum, they take about one to seven seconds. Okay. So you're talking less than seven seconds. Your detention times <clears throat> need to be less than 30 seconds at the absolute maximum. So maximum detention time in any of these reactors is 30 seconds. We also add <clears throat> baffling in order to prevent vortexing. So vortexing, you've got kind of this eddy formation, but that means that you don't have good mixing along the edges of the tank. So what we will often do is, and it's hard to kind of draw it in here, but basically if this is the wall, we put a baffle kind of out, in, out into the reactor. Often there would be four, so there would be one kind of been looking into the reactor, kind of facing in. So if we drew a view looking down, you'd see a baffle here, you'd see a baffle here, a baffle here, a baffle here. <clears throat> and that's to prevent, try and prevent this vortexing so that we get, we have improved mixing. Rarely will you ever see more than four. So an ideal reactor, we used the equation for detention time. What type of reactor do you think a rapid mix basin is best modeled as? So a reactor, okay, and then we have a CSTR. Okay. So we have mixing, we have a flow in, so we have Q of the water. We also have a flow. We're pumping in our coagulant and then we have the flow out. So what we have is we have a CSTR because we have a continual flow in and a continual flow out. So we'll model the reactor as a CSTR. Typically we'll operate, a detention time will be in seconds. That is not always the case. Some reactors Typically, we'll use minutes. In other cases, we will use hours. It depends on how long it takes for the reaction to occur. V is just volume, and Q is our flow rate. We can have non-ideal behavior, and that can be caused by density gradients, caused by temperature differences, short-circuiting, or dead spots. 
Ideally, we want as close to an ideal reactor as possible. We design these basins based on what we refer to as the velocity gradient or the G value. So if you think back to fluids, if you have flow of water, you have a velocity gradient. And that velocity varies with distance in the y direction, with the, the lowest velocity closest to the surface. So we're going to use this to estimate energy dissipation. We want to provide sufficient energy to mix the, co <clears throat> the coagulant with the water, but we don't want to provide too much energy because if we provide too much energy, we're just simply wasting, basically wasting money. We have to provide electricity in order to run the mixer and also the more mixing, you've got potential eddies forming. So the amount of shear that's taking place, the higher the G, the more violent the mixing. And G is a function of the power imparted by the mixer, by your motor. The, it's inversely proportional to the volume of water in the tank. The dynamic or absolute viscosity of the water. The more <clears throat> power, okay, our motor, the more the higher the G. For the same power, the greater the volume of our reactor, the lower the G. G values typically range from about 700 to 1,000. Notice they're in inverse seconds. Detention time, I just said 30 seconds. The book talks about 20 to 60 seconds. However, if you look at the 10 state standards, which they're also referred to, I will typically refer to them as the GLUM standards for the Great Lakes Upper Mississippi River Board standards. These are the standards that are typically used, or that are used in all of the Midwest states and are adapt, adopted by a number of states and even adapted by a number of countries. If you're looking at softening there the detention time is slightly longer but if you're looking at coagulation reactions as we've been looking at now detention times will be less than 30 seconds these basins vary from about one meter to three meters we'll talk more about that depth and this just gives you an idea of the power um, imparted in these systems. I'm not going to go over a lot of this in any great deal detail. We'll talk about this in the problem that we do. But again, just some information. Here's your baffling. If you do have vertical baffling, they shouldn't extend more than 10% of the tank width. So if you're talking about here, if this is our tank, notice these are not very large. Okay, they're relatively small. And then the other thing to think about is that we will typically use that the efficiency of transfer of motor power to water power is 0.8 for a single impeller, which means that your motor, the power of the motor must be 125% of the power imparted to the water. You lose energy, okay? Energy transfer isn't 100%, so you need to take into account, so you, your, the size of your motor will always be about 125% of what you calculate for the power imparted to the water. And the, this equation here is the power imparted to the water. So what we're calculating is the power imparted to the water. The motor power is 100, roughly 125% of that. You can just assume 125% 
for all of the problems that we do. So let's look at an example problem. So we have a square rapid mix basin. We have a depth that's equal to 1.25 times the width. The flow rate is our design flow rate. The velocity gradient is obtained from the jar test. We'll talk more about jar tests tomorrow. We'll actually get some video of the jar test that Joseph ran. We'll look at those. <clears throat> the detention time is 25 seconds. We're going to design this for an operating temperature of 10 degrees C, and we're going to assume a turbine shaft speed of 100 RPMs. And this is also, we've confirmed this with our jar test. We want to determine the basin dimensions, the power required, so that G value, and then we'll look at the impeller diameter, and we'll look at it both with baffling and without. So the volume is equal to our flow rate divided by the detention time. And we'll use the 25 second detention time that we were given. So that is, we need a reactor that has a volume of 2.19 meters squared. We have a square basin and we said that the depth is equal to 1.25 times the width. If it's square, the length is equal to the width. So we have length times width times depth. We can substitute <clears throat> width for the length. And for the depth, we have 1.25 times the width. And that is equal to 2.19 cubic meters. So my width is equal to 1.20. That equals my length. And therefore my depth is equal to 1.50 meters. Okay. One of the things to think about here as you're thinking of designing these, significant figures are critical because you can't give, if these are your plans, you can't give either a manufacturer or if it's a concrete basin, your contractor, you can't tell them to design their basin within a centimeter or two. So think about that in terms of the design when you're thinking of how many <clears throat> significant figures that you actually use. If we're looking at piping, then you actually have to look at the piping schedule because you're not gonna buy seven inch diameter piping, for example, unless you pay a lot of money to have it fabricated for that specific project. You're gonna buy six or eight. So let's just check the volume. And that equals 2.16 cubic meters so it's slightly different. I'm going to check the detention time, and it is 24.65 seconds, which is close enough to 25 seconds. So we're good there. So the next thing we need to do is determine the power required. And we have G is equal to the square root of power over the absolute or dynamic viscosity times the volume. G is equal to 790. Remember, we got that from the jar test. Times mu times V, and I need to square this. And that is equal to the power. So we have 790 inverse second squared times the viscosity, which I can look up in the appendix at the back of the textbook, times the volume. And that is 1,762 Newton meters per second, which is a joule per second, which is a watt. Okay, so it's almost 1,800 
watts of power that we need to impart to the reactor. Now we said that we had a vane disc impeller. What that looks like is this. So this is a vane disc impeller. We have six flat blades. It's a radial flow turbine impeller. We have four vertical baffles. And we're told that the impeller diameter should be 30 to 50% of the tank width. So we can use equation 6-17, where power is equal to the impeller constant, and that's provided by the manufacturer, times the rotational speed, and this is in revolutions per second, times the diameter, fifth power, times rho, the density of water. So what we're looking for is the diameter of the impeller. And N sub P is equal to 5.7. Again, you'd get that from the manufacturer. The question was, why did the volume change? The volume changed because back here, this is the volume that I calculated from the detention time that I was given. I then size the reactor and notice here, when I size this, I get a width of 1.2 meters and a depth of 1.5. I don't want a react, I don't want to design a reactor to the centimeter. Okay, so I designed the reactor to one, basically 1 1.2 meters rather than 1.203 meters in order, for instance, in order to get to achieve that 2.9. I have to be realistic. This d sub i is our impeller diameter, and that's what we're looking for, and this is in meters. So this impeller constant is obtained from the manufacturer. Textbook lists several um, different impellers and different types of impellers, and the impeller constants for the course, that's what we will use. So we have 1792, that's what we calculated, Newton meters per second, or watts, that is equal to 5.7 times 1.67 revolutions per second. Well, that's just taking the 100 revolutions per minute and dividing by 60 seconds per minute. That is to the third power. This is an empirical equation. The diameter of the impeller to the fifth power times the density of the water at 10 degrees and a, my diameter is equal to 0.58 meters. The last thing we want to do is check the criteria. This should be between 30 50% of the width of the reactor. So we'll take 0.58, I apologize, divided by, divided by 1.2, and that is equal to 0.486 or 48.6%. So we're within, we're high, but we're within the 30 to 50 one of the things you will need to do on your design project is you will need to check the GLOM standards. So whenever you're designing your reactors, you will need to go back and check to make sure that you're meeting the GLOM standards. If we have no baffles, Then the power imparted uh, 
um, to the water is 75% of that baffle tank. <clears throat> so the N sub P that you use is actually is 0.75 times the value given. Okay? Because it's 75%. Go through the same equation. we used before, but in this case, the diameter, when we calculate the diameter, it is 0.62 meters. Okay. Before we had 0.58, so we need a larger diameter impeller, which makes sense because there's less power imparted. <clears throat> And so we need to increase the size of the impeller. And then we check the criteria. So 0.62 divided by 1.2 meters. So we're dividing, we're taking our impeller diameter divided by the width of the reactor. And that is equal 0.51 or 51%, so we're slightly high. You can see the benefit of the baffled reactor. It also reduces the power required, which reduces our energy consumption, which reduces the operating costs. The last thing we want to do is let's just check the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is equal to the impeller diameter times N times rho divided by U, the viscosity. And that let's we're going to use the baffled reactor because they we have a smaller <clears throat> uh, diameter. It also means less power. Um, that we have to impart. So our motor power is less. So that's 0.58 meters squared times 1.67 inverse seconds. So it's revolutions per second times the density of water at 10 degrees. Divided by the viscosity at 10 degrees That is equal to almost 400, 400 well, it's 429,000. Do we have turbulent flow? Reynolds number is greater than about 10,000. We have turbulent flow. And we want turbulent flow in the rapid mix basin. So we'll stop there.